you know, there's, there are times like, for instance, my first book, when I took it to a local pu um, publisher and they rejected it. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was so discouraged and disappointed. It's like, I, I look back, I'm so grateful. Thank goodness. If they had said yes, it would have changed everything. It's like, and I can just see God up there going, no, I have big things in store. Mm -hmm. I have a global bestseller for you, not a local um, cultural flash in the pan. Right. And that's, which is exactly what it would have been. Welcome to Stories of Hope in Hard Times, the show that explores how people endure and even thrive in difficult times, all with God's help. I'm your host, Tamara K. Anderson. Join me on a journey to find inspiring stories of hope and wisdom learned in life's hardest moments. When my next guest wrote the number one global bestseller, The Christmas Box, he never intended on becoming an internationally known author. This story was written as an expression of love for his then two young daughters. Since then, more than eight million copies of The Christmas Box have been printed. He has won the American Mother's Book Award, two first place storytelling awards, the Romantic Times Best Women's Novel of the Year Award, the German Lesser Priest Gold Award for Romance. He is a five-time recipient of the Religion Communicators Council Wilbur Award and more than a dozen other awards for his young adult series, Michael Vey. His most recent new release, Noel Street, just became his 40th book to hit the New York Times bestseller list. He is the founder of the Christmas Box International, an organization devoted to maintaining emergency shelters and providing services and resources for abused, neglected, or homeless children, teens, and young adults. He and his wife, Carrie, have five children and have been blessed with two grandchildren. I am pleased to present Richard Paul Evans. Rick, are you ready to share your story of hope? Uh, absolutely. Thank you. Awesome. So I have to first say that Rick has become a great friend and mentor to me. I went to his first premier author training almost three years ago. And it's hard to believe it's been that long. Wow. I know, right? And he and has, Tamara was a dynamo there. <laughs> we yeah. had a lot of fun and mm -hmm. I learned so much. I felt like I was drinking out of a fire hose just with the amount of knowledge he imparted on not only writing, but on marketing books. It's just been an amazing resource for me. So I'm, I'm pleased to finally get him on the show today. <laughs> so I hear, first of all, that you are excellent at making crepes. Diane told me. <laughs> I, I am. I am the crepe king. <laughs> Where did the passion for crepes I, I do. come from? You know, I was in Seattle and uh, staying at a friend's house and they made crepes. And I thought, these are really good. I wanted to learn how to make them. And then I just decided this was, everyone should know how to make three things, right? Yeah. To cook three things. And that's, I know how to make three things. French toast, crepes, and um, fried rice. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it. If you stay with me, that's what you eat every meal, right? That is awesome. That's great. So I was I just finished your most recent book, um, Noel Street, and I love how you ended it because I think it is indicative of a little bit of a picture into your life. He says, um, I've always thought of God as an artist, one who uses our hopes fears, dreams, and especially our tears to paint on the canvas of our souls, rendering something beautiful. The hardest part, I suppose, is waiting to see what he's up to. So in your books, you dive into people that are broken and who are kind of waiting to see what God is painting on the canvas of their lives. Can we go back in your life and talk about some of the times when maybe you felt broken that has enabled you to write so almost first person about some of these characters that you bring to life on page? Oh, absolutely. In fact, I'm, <clears throat> I'm, working, on, I'm working on a book I'm really excited about. It's almost a project of taking just my um, writings over the last 25 years. Uh -huh. And I've been testing it on the road, sharing these. It kind of along the vein of everything I need to know I learned in kindergarten. Oh. And so um, it just hit me. I should write a book like this. And so, because some of my blogs have been read by tens of millions of people. I thought I should compile them all 
And so I came up with a name for my blog and, and the people in Boise, I first shared it with, my readers hated it. Really? Oh, no. And, and well, they kind of said, nah, yeah, yeah. And I gave another name. Yeah, yeah. And then this woman walked up and she handed me a slip of paper. She goes, this is what you should name it. And then two other people did, did the same thing. And she goes, Rick, that's really, my assistant Diane said, that's really weird because look at this letter. And she handed me a letter she had been carrying from a, a high school kid back east. And it actually started with the, these words. I go, that's not a sign. Holy okay, so, so What so, is so it? So this is, this is the title, Ricky Evans, The Great. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> well, so what happens, people here, it's like, oh, that's funny, amusing. And they tell the story and they're sobbing. Oh. Like wiping their eyes and puffy eyes. I was in Fort Wayne, Indiana. It was almost, it was almost, it was, I almost laughed because some of the women were crying so hard. So, do you want to hear the story? Yes, and this is please. indicative of what you talked about. Um, 1970 was a really bad year for my family. My, we lived in, at the time, just outside of Pasadena, California, in mm -hmm. Arcadia. My father lost his job and was blackballed in the community where he worked in Beverly Hills. And with eight kids, we, we quickly went from bad to worse. It was desperate. We lost everything. My, my dad found a job um, teaching in Pocatello, Idaho. Oh. And so half of us, you know, the four kids stayed in, in California, and he took the older ones, and they moved to Pocatello, and he taught school and living in an apartment up there. And um, we were trying to get the family back together. And, and eventually, we a home, um, the family offered the home my grandmother had lived in when she died in, in Utah. And it's an inner city um, home in our inner city area. My mom said how great it was, right? Because it was like in the country when she was little, which was 30 years earlier. Right. Well, now it's next to bars and pawn shops. Oh, gosh. And, <laughs> and so um, it was a bad place. And so we, we all moved there. And the house had, had been empty. And it was a really old home. It was like 70 years old then. And, and it, was, it was empty. And it was, except for rats, it was filled with rats. Oh, gosh. And so that people ask my Michael Vay book why they feed people the rats. It's like, because that was my life as that, that age when I was a kid. I'd sit there at night and hear the rats running around. And that movie Willard was big. So my brother's older brothers, of course, told me the rats would eat me if I got out of bed. Oh, gosh. And so, <laughs> and so um, anyway, it was a perfect storm. I mean, here we have no money. My dad, um, who was in hospital management, is now doing construction work. And my mother... Um, began uh, exhibiting the first severe signs of something that would last a long time of mental Ill illness. She became highly suicidal. She was incredibly depressed. She would stay in her room for days at a time. Oh. And my dad, so my dad was gone all day. So we basically had no parents. And I was uh, eight, 39. It was also the same year my Tret syndrome manifested. So here we move into this inner city neighborhood, no money and no parents. Uh, the first Saturday, my mom took the three youngest, youngest of us, took us to State Street and dropped us at, off at a dollar theater. And I remember as we walked out, we were surrounded by a gang of kids. And they had brought all these kids to, who wanted to see us get beaten up. And I mean, it's like, wow, welcome to Utah. And oh, um, I'll never forget this. They sat there and taunted us. And I'm eight years old and fine. It's like, okay, I'll fight you. You know, and this kid's like a foot taller than me. And um, my older brother, who's about my size, he finally couldn't take it. His little brother defending them. And he walked over and pushed me aside. My brother actually beat the kid up. Wow. And uh, yeah, just, it was almost the fury of everything. And he just beat the kid to the ground. I just remember him kicking him in the face on the ground, the guy screaming for mercy, this big kid, right? Wow. Of course, everyone's laughing because everyone loves to see a bully get their due. And so then the, the crowd disperses. My mom pulls up in the station wagon and we just get in. We don't tell her a word. We just get in and wow. go home. That was our life at the time. Um, <clears throat> in the midst of all this, um, there was just tremendous bullying that was going on. And like one day I just didn't, I, I was so tired of being bullied. I just stayed home. My mother never knew it. Mm. She never came out of bedroom. It was just like, she just, I just stayed home. She didn't know I didn't go to school. And that was our life at the time. And so during this time to make it worse, I had this soul crushing teacher named Mrs. Covey. And to, to show what she was like, okay. Mm -hmm. A week before Christmas, she has all the kids. He goes, how many of you believe in Santa Claus? And, you know, I'm eight years, or I just turned nine. We, so most of the kids raise, raise their hands sure. in the class. And, and she goes, don't be stupid. There is no Santa Claus. Your parents, oh, your parents lied to you. <laughs> what teacher <laughs> says that? <laughs> this, the, I call, we call her Covey the Ogre. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah she, the, the, she said that. So I'm like, like, what? And we're all sitting there. It's just like this nasty person just like 
dashed our beliefs, right? It's just like, what? So I go home and go in my mom's darkened bedroom. I said, Mom, Mrs. Covey said there is no Santa Claus. And she goes, Rick, Santa Claus is the spirit of giving. And I said, but he has a reindeer and sleigh, right? And he comes down the chimney and she just looked at me and she goes, no, there is no Santa Claus. Oh. And my heart was just broken. It's like, wait a second. You're, it's like faith and goodness and good people are supposed to prevail, not the nasty ones. And, and it's like, so I looked at it for a moment and I said, well, did you lie about Jesus too? And that was the life at that time. And mm -hmm. well, it was um, a few months after that, I had uh, walking home from school and I got, I got beaten up by some boys and they took my only treasure, my Mickey Mouse watch, oh. the only thing I owned. And, um, and the next day I'm sitting there in class and it's like, I, I turn in my paper, I do my homework and I write down Ricky Evans on the top of it. And then something possesses me to write the great. <laughs> now, I was not arrogant. I had no reason to believe I great. I, I, I didn't believe I was anything. I had no parents that were involved. I had no friends. I had no one who would defend me. I was nothing. But just for a few seconds, it felt good to write that. And I uh, turned the paper in. The next day, I get the paper back. And Mrs. Covey has erased the two extraneous words and wrote three of her own. Shame on you. Oh, gosh. And then she gets up and gives a lecture on pride <laughs> and sin. Of all people, right? Mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, you know, I, I haven't seen Mrs. Covey since, since then, right? I mm -hmm. mean, since I graduated and we moved in or I left fourth grade. And um, I would like to, though. I mean, she was, I'm sure she's long dead. That she's, she was like 200 years old back then. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> but it's like, I would, I would like to see her. I mean, I would like to look her in the eyes and say, look, that little boy went on to reach tens of millions of people with his words. His mm -hmm. movies were some of the biggest in the world on, on television. And and his he started a shelter that helped house more than 100,000 abused children. He's been invited to the White House. He's danced in the green room. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. you know what? Um, that Ricky Edmonds was greater than Richard Paul Edmonds because that mm -hmm. little boy had nothing. He got up every day and got himself ready and ate gruel for breakfast and walked to school. You know, mm -hmm. every single day, and he just did his best to miss all the abuse and the, and the violence, and and just tried to be a good kid. I go, Ricky Evans was great, and you women are just mean. Mm. So, and the thing is, we all have in our life people who walk around with these erasers. And Mrs. Covey's trying to erase, erase the greatness from the, our lives. Mm -hmm. You know, I've learned just don't listen to them, don't let them, don't give them that power. Don't don't wait around for people to validate who you are because you'll be waiting a long time. Yeah. You know, so that's a powerful lesson to learn, though, because you're right. There are a lot of good people, but there are those who just want to take everyone's joy. And I don't know what what motivates that, but there are people like that. And so you are great. And I'm glad you wrote that. I would <laughs> I would have given you like three stars, you know, like, good job. <laughs> well, I, mean, I want everyone to write. Yeah, right. Next to, you know, do it. It's like, yeah, you know. Absolutely. Right, right, right that they're great. Tell their kids that they're great. Tell their, I was talking about hubris, you know. I just I want them to to acknowledge their intrinsic value and worth. That's what they need. Yeah. It's absolutely. like, yeah, you are you are great and beautiful in your soul is in, in spite of your bad choices and decisions and your circumstance. It's like that greatness resides within you and you don't get it out by erasing it. No, not at so. all. No, that's beautiful. Now, you mentioned um, that you have struggled with Tourette's. What are some of the lessons you've learned from Tourette's? And I know you talk a lot about Tourette's in your series, Michael Vay. Right, right, because my son Michael has Tourette's, so I, that's why I wrote the series for him. And I wanted to make Tourette's more mainstream because it's always just a joke, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I have Tourette's syndrome. You know, I you hear it all the time. Mm -hmm. They swear, well, it's my Tourette's. Mm -hmm. Like, well, some of us actually do have Tourette's. And, mm -hmm. uh, um, that the swearing is is what people usually you know think of it as is coprolalia and uh, that's only about ten percent. I have the impulse to swear, but I um, I couldn't figure out as a little kid. I'd sit there and I want to say bad words or inappropriate words. I sit there and it's like, oh my gosh, you're so bad. So um, couldn't figure out what was going on. But Tretz is um Tretz is interesting. I mean, it's it, I just thought it was really weird. It wasn't I, I wasn't actually diagnosed until I was forty. Really? Yeah, I just, I, I was asked, I had a few people ask me when I was younger, it's like, do you have Tourette's? And I would, no, no, it's just like, it was, why are you asking me that? 
Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't go around swearing. You know, it's like I didn't understand either. Um, I was diagnosed when we started to notice some problems with my son. Oh, yeah. really? Well, he's two years old and swearing. I mean, it's just like, <laughs> it's like, where did you even hear these words? It's like, okay, something is going on here. Uh -huh. So, um, but that, that too, I mean, there's a lesson. I'm, this is great. This is like an ad from my book that I'm working on because there's a story in there about Tourette's. Um, I was speaking at a, at a church and I was talking about grace and God's love for us. And I get this anonymous letter from from someone after and she writes in this she goes you have no place in the house of god oh gosh yeah, you have no place speaking you're you're obviously a sinful man i can see through it because i saw you you were ticking you know you're blinking and twitching and stuff it's like mm. i go yeah, yeah i go yeah yeah i am a sinner <laughs> like we, you i mean like we're all mm -hmm. we're all broken i said but but you know what it's like that's not why it's twitching i was twitching because i have Tourette syndrome and so I actually, I wrote, I wrote this blog that was called to the woman at church who wrote me an anonymous letter. I posted it one night on Facebook and next morning I got up and there were 80,000 shares. Oh, <laughs> it's like, oh my, my God. Word. It's like, wow, this went, cause I, it was like, people wanted to help find that woman. I said, I don't know where she is because <laughs> she's anonymous. But maybe she'll see it here. Um, so it just went, it went viral. Uh, but then I said, you know, the, I go, the sad thing is, so when I was little, I would have believed you that I was evil because, I mean, I, I remember at, during this bad time and I'm, have, I'm ticking and during a time with Mrs. Covey, right? Mm -hmm. um, there was, I remember this church leader came to church and someone told me he was really important. I thought, well, maybe if I shake his hand, my, my threats, if I have faith, my threats will go away. Obviously, I'm a really deep thinking thinker for a nine-year-old. Oh, actually, yeah, I, absolutely. I, I, I actually was. <laughs> I look at some of the things I was thinking about and... Um, but so I went up, I stood in line and I shook his hand, but my treads didn't go away. So I thought, well, there's something, I don't have faith, mm -hmm. you know, um, I'm obviously not that good of a person. And, um, you know, I really struggled. And the thing is this woman, what she said is to me, it's a joke now. It's like, you know, in your small little world, it's like, I, I have had an amazing life. I've met Kings and premier and prime ministers and presidents. And, mm -hmm. you know, I've spent time with three presidents at length that they're, you know, their homes. I mean, it's just like, and, you know, she can't touch me now. And mm -hmm. I, you know, and I, but I still tick, you know, and sometimes my wife will reach over and touch my cheek and just ask if I'm okay. It's really sweet. And my kids don't even see it. They just see a dad who loves them. Right. But there are little boys and girls who are, who listen to people like that, who hear that, who are reminded of their disability. And some of these kids take their lives and, you know, it's that, that part makes me mad, this woman. Yeah. It's like, you know, I, 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 hope, I hope that my letter would open her eyes or at least her heart. Um, but, you know, it's just sad that, um, you know, I said the greatest disability isn't Tourette's or neurological disease. The greatest disability is the inability to love someone who's different than you. That's true. And that's, you know, there's people like that. That's, it, they're not as much. And I think people are, are becoming much more tolerant of differences. I, I think our kids are much more tolerant than we were. I agree. You know, no, I agree. Yeah. I know my kids, especially. Well, obviously, they have two two brothers. My my typical kids have two brothers with disability. You know, with autism, and they have such compassion for anyone. It doesn't matter what they look like or anything like that. And I just think that is such a benefit to them growing up in this world that they just love people no matter what. Yeah, well, they're different. That's okay. You know. Yeah, we all we all have disabilities. I'm just carry. We just carry it different. Yeah, yeah, that's true. We're going to take a quick break, but when we get back, we're going to have Richard Paul Evans tell us a little bit more about how to find God in your hard times. How many of you out there feel like your life is chaotic, crazy, and completely awful compared to the norm? What if I were to tell you that you are normal for you? I am so excited to announce that my book, Normal For Me by Tamara K. Anderson is now available for purchase on Amazon. This book took me 10 years to write and I share 20 years worth of lessons learned in my life detours, including being in a car accident and having two of my children diagnosed on the autism spectrum. In this book, I share the secrets of how I made it from despair to peace with God's help. I also include a bonus diagnosis survival guide at the very end of my Normal For Me book. The diagnosis survival guide 
includes 12 tips to survive and thrive in tough times. Wouldn't you like to know what those are? So what are you waiting for? Grab your copy of Normal For Me today on Amazon. And we're back. I am interviewing Richard Paul Evans about his personal experiences that have helped mold him to become such an influential author and move us to tears in many instances. We've been talking about some of the hard times Rick passed through in his childhood and dealing with Tourette's as a challenge growing up. So I know you address the issue of where is God in my trials in a lot of your books. I noticed it coming through in, in even your most recent book. Um, and how did how were you able to answer that through all of your hard times, you know, from the time you were little, you know, even growing up, struggling with bullying and stuff like that? How How did you continue to believe in God through all of it? Well, the, the philosopher Kierkegaard said that um, we we can understand our life looking backwards, but we must live them for, forwards. Mm-hmm. And looking back, I can clearly see the hand of God. You know, I, this, there are times like, for instance, my first book when I took it to a local pu- um, publisher and they rejected it, mm-hmm. and I was, I was so discouraged and disappointed. And it's like I, I look back, I'm so grateful. Thank goodness. If they had said yes, it would have changed everything. It's like, and I can just see God up there going, no, I have big things in store. Mm-hmm. I have a global bestseller for you, not a local um, cultural flash in the pan. Right. And that's, which is exactly what it would have been. So, um, you know, looking back, you, I can definitely see his hand. But, but the reality is it comes down to this um, personal relationship, this, this sense of reaching out. And even in the hard times, saying, I don't know why is happening but i trust you mm-hmm. and that trust has never felt me and there have been times when i've been absolutely just completely brought to my knees i mean that and but to hold on to it, it's like i know you won't drop me father i know i know it. i just but i don't why are you letting me get hurt like this and and then looking back and you say wow i see i understand but it was also you know those those things in my life um made me who i am Mm-hmm. I mean, my, I was having dinner with my brother the other day and hadn't talked to him for, for years, actually, uh, about just talk. And, mm-hmm. and um, he goes, just imagine if those things hadn't happened, who would you be? Mm-hmm. I said, yeah, I'd be a very different person. Um, I, I definitely wouldn't be the empathetic person I am. And I've, I've come to be very grateful that I have Tourette syndrome, something that set me apart. Um, and, you know, I can reach out and touch other people in the same place. And it's a blessing. Um, I was at a Comic-Con, and this teenage girl came up to me, and she goes, Mr. Evans, may I hug you? I said, yeah. And and, um, she goes, I love you. And I said, why do you love me? And she goes, I have Tourette syndrome like you do. And the kids used to tease me. You know, it's like, why would you tease someone with a disability? Why would you, would you tease someone in a wheelchair? Mm -hmm. She goes, they're just teasing me, and I don't understand why. And she goes, then, um, she goes, then your book, Michael Vay, became their favorite book and their hero and and he has Tourette's syndrome and and now they think it's kind of cool that I have Tourette's and she goes I just I just want to say thank you and I just thought how and I just told her I loved her too and I'm so glad you know you're not defined by that and I'm just so glad that it helped oh I think that's amazing I know it's uh my two youngest, it's their um, fav- one of their favorite books. <laughs> my daughter, she like she is kind of moved from reading because she's so busy doing a lot to listening to a lot of audiobooks. And she finally came to me and she says, I need all the Michael Vay audiobooks, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so having the books isn't enough. We need the audiobooks the now, audiobooks too. <laughs> so it really has um, has a special place for these teenagers, especially those who struggle or feel different. It makes them feel like, you know what? My life is worth something. And I think that's probably one of the biggest messages in your books is that we all have that value, you know? And, and it's amazing to hear you speak about that. Um, in such a personal way in each of your stories. And that's probably why people like them so much, because we all feel broken, you know? Yeah, and, it, and you, just, yeah, you just said something that kind of uh, reminded me of something. It's like 
the books are are true. You can feel it when you read it. It's oh, like, this guy, yes. this guy, this guy gets it. Um, when I was diagnosed with Tourette's syndrome, the doctor who diagnosed me, he said, um, "I actually don't take clients. I'm doing this because I wanted to return the favor. Because I'm a research specialist, one of the top in the country with Tourette's, and I wanted to see if I could help you because you helped me." I said, "How do I help? How do I help you? I've never met." And he said, "Oh, more than you can imagine. We lost our only child, oh. and my wife was." Um, really taking it hard to the point I thought she might even take her life and I couldn't help her and my psychologist friends couldn't help her and then she read one of your books and it's like it gave her hope she changed I mean did reading that one book changed her whole orientation towards what had happened and and I saw her smile again for the first time in years and he said it was it was powerful he said the thing is she could trust you she could when she read it she knew this is a person who had suffered and had she goes that her place of darkness, she recognized someone else who was walking through the dark and could take her hand. I thought that was a really beautiful thing. It's like, and the thing is, my books are they're they're written from the heart. They're real, and so I bring that up because what sparked it, what sparked this idea, what you just said is, um, I wrote a blog called "How I Saved My Marriage," and it's a very raw blog, and I mm-hmm. posted it. Well, it went viral. I, mean, I remember looking it up and it had 90,000 readers at that moment. Oh, it's, it's like, so incredible, it had, right? It had millions. It, and yeah, and all of a sudden it's like Huffington Post contacts me and it's like, we have, we want to take it. I see it come over on, on a Facebook blog. It has 24 million readers on this one blog. It's like, I mean, this one post. It's like, oh my gosh. People, I'm hearing all, everywhere I'd go, people would stop me. People didn't, didn't know who I was before. It's like, you wrote the marriage blog. And, um, it was really remarkable to see the power of that. Of, of um, But... My wife didn't like it. <laughs> she, she was upset. She, she, she goes, she, it was funny because I, I, I was actually upstairs returning correspondence with Huffington Post who wanted to translate it into 11 languages. Oh, my. And she goes, did you, did you post that blog? Did you post that thing about how I saved my marriage? I go, yeah. And she goes, they're talking about it on the local, on the Channel 4 News. Oh, no. <laughs> and it's like, yeah. It's like, I didn't tell you you could share this story. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, well, honey, it's like you've heard me give it in public to to literally thousands of people. It's uh-huh. like it never occurred to me. It's like it's embarrassing. And, and she was really mad that I posted. She goes, you need to take it down. I said, well, you can't take down a blog. It's, it's out. It's out. It's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it's past me. And, and um, that night we go to dinner and she was still mad at me. We go to dinner and there's a couple there and they, and it had been out for about a week and a half, right, at this point. And, and um, this couple look at me and they go, like, you're Richard Paul Evans. And I said, yeah. And it's like, well, we're here because of you. And I go, this, I, this restaurant I've never written about. She goes, no, we're here together because we were going to get divorced. And we read your blog and um, we decided we're going to save our marriage. And I said, tell her. I pointed the carriage. <laughs> and she goes, she goes, I know. And afterwards, she's like, I know. I've had three friends call me and tell me you saved their kid's marriage. It's like. Oh, my goodness. And, gracious. you know, I was hearing from marriage counselors. One marriage counselor told me he gives it the first thing when someone walks in, they, he hands it to him. Wow. Um, so and she said something that was really interesting to me. She goes, you share too much. Mm. She goes, no, th- okay, this is this." Way. She goes, I said, finally, she kept she kept getting mad. We kept getting in fights about it, which is <laughs> ironic, right? <laughs> yes. About not about a blog, about how we stopped fighting. And finally, after like three weeks ago, Carrie, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that embarrasses you. But I go, is there anything I wrote that wasn't true? Mm-hmm. She goes, that's the problem, and it's all true. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and she goes, but. You share too much. And I'm glad she said that because I, I thought about from what I said, I share too much. I go, no, I don't. Someone needs to tell the truth in this world. Mm-hmm. And I said, that's what I do. That's yeah. why I've sold 35 million books. It's like I tell the truth and I'm honest. And I said, I don't know any other way to write. If I, if I had to lie in my books or create something that was false, I couldn't do it. I'd just stop. And I said, you know what, Carrie? I'm a good husband. I mean, I know I'm a good husband because I work hard to be a good husband. Mm-hmm. I take good care of you. You pretty much get whatever you want. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like I, you know, if you want to watch that movie, watch that movie. You know, mm-hmm. if you want to go to dinner, it's just like, and anything, you know, I, um, I take good care of you. I said, but on this, you're asking me to choose between you and God. And what God gave me, I said, in this case, you lose. Mm-hmm. I said, God wants me to do this. And um, this is where I draw the line. I go, this is, I, you don't win over God. And Carrie thought for a moment, and she goes, fair enough. Mm. Fair enough. 
And I thought it was, it was really a powerful moment because it was a defining moment for me too. It's like, yeah, this is what I do. And uh, this is why I came here, to share messages of hope with the world. And, and uh, if you're asking me not to do that, it's like, this is one place that it's like, that you, as much as I love you, this is what I have to do and who I am. And that rejection of me is just not okay. Yeah, absolutely. So, so you, you do, you talk a lot about hope and you seem to write a Christmas book every year. I do. Um, there was one quote in here that I loved and I, I, I have to read it because you said, um, Christmas is about hope. The wise men traveled far to find a mother with her child in a simple manger. The same is true for me. I may not be wise, but I was searching, and God in his infinite goodness sent me a star. Um, That's really good. I wrote that really. You really <laughs> wrote that. It's on page. Sometimes people will quote this stuff. Like the first one you read, I go, did I really? Someone posted one of my quotes. I go, That's really good. I wish I had said that. I realized I had. <laughs> Like, wow. So, yeah, that's really good. I thought, oh, my goodness. So because here we are, we're coming up to the Christmas season and people don't always feel hope at the Christmas season. And yet you say Christmas is about hope. Tell me a little bit about how you find hope during the Christmas season and, and how you're able to share it in, in your books. Well, Christmas to me was always it was and is still magical. I like, I like what Dickens said, he said um, in A Christmas Carol. That's one time of the year when we view ourselves as we truly are, fair, uh, fellow passengers to the grave. And mm. we can stop and actually show kindness to the world, show kindness to people we don't know, to strangers. And um, that's a powerful thing. And as a kid, there was always something really magical. And that's why Mrs. Covey was so, you know, what she did was so hard because yeah there's beauty to the magic of this one time of the year when you know we struggled financially but but still magical things happen that one day and um i think that part of it still resonates in me and i just love it i love i mean when i'm down i'll listen to christmas music now and then you know it's Mm. just um, the nice thing is getting the mood to write books it may be june but i'll (laughs) put on some christmas music in the case of Noel Street, it was interesting because I'm listening to 1975 music, which was really great. Um, oh, yeah. You know, there was classics but, back well, then. Well, aside of Captain and Tennille, Love Will Keep Us Together. I mean, <laughs> it's like there was Bad Company and there was some great uh, Queen and there was some great music going on. Then. Um, you know, but um, Christmas is so magical. And so I continue to write, Chris, or write Christmas to every book. It's not like Noel Street. So I said, well, how is this a Christmas book? You know, it's really about you know, 1975 in Vietnam and Mm -hmm. love story. And it's like, no, it's, it's just a little bit a backdrop. That's where it happened. And I, some magic happens during that time. But, um, you know, it's just, it's more of a, it's almost like setting. It's like, you know, it's like Debbie Maycumber setting all of her, um, books in a, you know, a city in Puget Sound. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, my, my city is Christmas Mm. It's sitting in that place. So it is the town, the locale becomes a character in the book in a way. Mm, yeah, no, but you, you can feel that hope, that hope that miracles do happen. And, and that's what you feel by the end of your books is the hope that good triumphs over evil in the case of Michael Way, you know, mm-hmm. that um, things that are broken can be repaired. Um, and that is just so inspirational. And, and I think that is also obviously the message of my podcast is why I bring people on my show is to have them share their stories and people think, well, gosh, if they could do that and become someone, the great, right? (laughs) Ricky Evans, the great, you know, maybe there's hope for me. And so I think the power of stories is incredible. Um, They have, and and you have a way of weaving your words that there is, there's magic there. (laughs) You just have a gift. And it's awesome that you share it with the world. So let me ask you this. What, what tips would you give to people who, who perhaps are down on their luck? They're feeling really, really broken. What would you say to encourage them on their path? During those times when it's dark, it's really hard to see the light. And, um, you know, keeping things in perspective. Life is cyclical. I remember feeling it's like, how come every time I start to get up, I get knocked down again? It's like just for years and years and years. And I remember thinking, why does God hate me? 
Mm. Um, and trying to keep that perspective. I mean, right now it's easy to look back and say, well, look at this great success I've had, and these great things. Um, but even then there were some really hard times and being a parent is really an Achilles heel. Um, you know, during some of the times when people think, oh, your life is, is you got it made. It's like, there are times I just wanted to die. There are times like, okay, we, we had, had a son who has, uh, you know, a disability and struggling with him so hard sometimes at times it would bring me to my knees. And, and so, I mean, my, my hope comes in my, my faith in, in God, that there is, there's something different, but I never really said, okay, but everything's going to be okay in this life because life is hard. Mm. You know, a Buddha, you know, the first law of Buddhism, right? The first pillar that life is suffering. And it's like, that's the reality. And I love the line from Labyrinth. Anyone who tells you life isn't suffering is trying to sell you something. <laughs> and people yes. get a sense of, oh, life's supposed to be easy. It's like, who told you that? Mm -hmm. Life isn't easy. Look at nature. Oh, my goodness. Oh, yeah. It's like it is dog eat dog and, you know, nature red and claw and tooth. It's like, it's life is hard. The fact that we, I, I'm, I'm a little bit more surprised as I wrote in one of my books not in people's evil, but that people are good at all. Mm. You know, um, that to me is the biggest sign of hope that there's something there. And these moments, these really tough moments, really, the really dark nights is where we see the stars. It's, I look back at the times I'm most proud of, and it's like Ricky Evans, the great, it's like those times when I just tried to do the right thing. And I've had those times um, come out through different times of life. I remember just sitting there and just having some, something horrible happen with one of my kids and just saying, I will love, I choose to be love in the, in, 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 in all this hate and all this anger and, and tragedy. I choose to be love and just feeling the, um, to realize that I can make that choice. Mm -hmm. And Victor Frankl in man's social media, I mean, he, what, what he went through is like so far more than any of us will ever yes. um, experience. But what he said about it's like, even in those darkest times, we can choose to be worthy of our sufferings. Mm. And it took me a while to understand what that meant. And he said, that's the one thing they can't take away. Even to the point of death, they can't take that away. And so I think that's why so often I write in there, you know, to me, the most poignant part of all scripture is, is, is Jesus Christ knelt to a cross and looking up and saying, why have you deserted me? Mm. And C.S. Lewis said something that was really powerful. He said in those greatest moments, he said, why, when the man, he goes, nowhere, and he's talking to screw tape letters, the demons are, talk, demons are talking to each other. And he said, mm -hmm. nowhere is our cause of evil more threatened when a man nailed to a cross, looks up into a, a universe devoid of God, say, why have you des deserted me? And still, he marches on. Mm -hmm. And still, he holds fast to truth. He goes, that shakes the very core of all evil. Mm -hmm. And there are a few of those moments in life where it's like, I have nothing here, but I will not fail. And that to me is the, is the bottom line of all nobility and of all greatness. And the time that I look at um, are, are, that are greatest are not when I get some award or some best, another bestseller or whatever I achieve. My greatest moments in my life were very private victories. They were very alone. And there are times when on my knees and I will not stop. I will not fall. I want to. I want to stop. Um, when we did our charity, there was a time when our board voted to close down the Christmas box house. Mm. We don't have the money. Everything's going. And I said, I, wa I wanted to close it down. And my dad got up and gave an impassioned speech and said, look, it's bankrupting my son. It's like he didn't come in for this. He's not gonna, we're not getting support from the community. And I said, just a moment. And I left and I walked into a, uh, into a mechanical closet and knelt down next to a water heater and said, can I quit? Please, may I quit? And very distinct impression came to me and said, if you fell, no one will succeed. Wow. And um, I thought, damn. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, so, so, I'm over here uh, getting all teary because I've asked that question a couple of times. Can yeah. I stop this? And God yeah. says, no. Like, yeah. dang it. <laughs> I know. It's like, so I get back, I go back to the room and I go, no, we're not going to quit. And here, one of the guys, he was a president of of a residential treatment center, the largest in the state of Utah. And so this guy who knows, he goes, you don't know that you're failing. You don't, Rick, you can't <laughs> see that the ship's going down. It's like, I know exactly what's going on. And I said, but I'm not released from this. And the ship's going down, and I guess I have to go down with it. And anyone here, I'll, I'll accept all your resignations if you want to leave. But um, otherwise, let's get on with business. 
wow. and everyone stayed there. And it's like, I look back now, we just had a board meeting last week. It's like, we, we have helped more than a hundred thousand children. Things are good financially. We're the best place we've ever been. Mm. Um, the strength of it, the community relations, like, Oh my, I sat there. I just, I thought, wow, what a different world from being on the verge of collapse. And, um, you know, I'm so grateful that God didn't let me quit as much as I wanted to. It's like, this hurts. Mm. You know, it's like that perfect coach. It's like, this is hurting. This hurts more than I can say. And it, it hurts all the time in the morning. And night. It's like, it's like, yes. it's like, give me a little hope here. Give me something to see and just enough to keep going. But those, those are the great moments. Yes. They those are. we look back and like, those are the moments that I was great. Yes. You know, when not not the times that the public will see, that the public will try to honor you or give you awards. Just like, no, the great times were very personal victories that maybe no one sees but you and God. Yeah. So the biggest advice then is get on your knees. Yeah. Yes. I, I mean, that is the, because we, we are not deserted. No. You know, we are not we are not alone, even when it feels like it. Yeah. So I remember one time in the hardest time, I felt like I was crawling on glass. And my daughter, Jenna, said to me, where is God? Why has he left you alone, Dad? You are carrying this by yourself. Oh. And I said, and the thing is, you know, people say, oh, God was there when Christ looked up to the heavens and said, you know, why have you deserted me? But he just couldn't see. He's like, no, Christ knew what was going on. He was alone. Mm -hmm. And there are times that God leaves us like, no, I'm going to let you have this. I'm going to let you walk alone. I'm going to let you have the greatness and understand what it is to be great. And there are times I said, you know, I said, I know I'm alone. Mm. And pleading. I'm trying to keep my son alive and pleading with God. It's like, I am doing everything. I don't know how much longer I can take this. Yeah. Okay. Carrie has finally broken down. It's like, it's just me. Mm -hmm. and I don't know how long I can carry the entire family and all of this. We need help. And I remember after um, going to a hospital and having this incredible experience um, with my son. And it was so crazy. And then walking out and saying, okay, I've done everything I can. Walking into a room, kneeling down and saying, Okay, it's in your hands. He's your mm. son. He's your son too. I have given everything, and I knew at that point I had nothing else to give. Yeah, and miracle, incredible miracle happened at that moment. That all of a sudden everything switched, and was so powerful and such a faith promoting thing. But I knew, I knew at that point there are times when I say, "Okay, I'm done." And I say, "No, you're not." But at that moment, it's like I, I, I've given it all. It's done. Yeah, I knew it. I knew it in my heart. It's like it's done. I, I have nothing more to give. I've given everything I can. And then it didn't mean I just stopped because then I had um, I had a, a lot of work over the next um, weeks connecting with my son. I spent hours every day being with him and helping him. And um, what a great ending to that story because my yeah. son and I are buddies. Um, I'm so proud of him. Yeah. I'm so proud of what he's accomplished and what he's overcome. He said to me, it's like, wow, one of my sisters is a, an intense pediatric nurse, very successful. Another's doing makeup and things for movies. Another's an international best-selling author. Another's a scientist. And then there's me. And I said, and you have accomplished more than all of them. You have climbed a higher mountain than all of them. Never forget that. Yeah. Because we can't measure our success based on what everybody else has done. We each have our own burdens and our own mountains, as you yeah. say, to climb. Absolutely. So be proud of yourself and recognize your strengths. All right. Well, it looks like our time is up. Thank you, Richard Paul Evans, for spending this time with us and for motivating us to keep going even when times look dark. You can find Richard Paul Evans on his website, mm -hmm. richardpaulevans.com, mm -hmm. and on Facebook. That's where you're most active, right? Right. Yes. Awesome. If you would like to get Richard Paul Evans' most recent book, Noel Street. You may find it on Amazon or in Barnes and Noble, or you can find out more about his books on his website. We will put a link to richardpaulevans.com in the show notes. And thank you, Rick, for coming on and sharing your personal stories that have touched our hearts and helped us realize that we're not alone in feeling broken and that by turning to God in our times of need, we can have the strength to keep going even when we feel alone and someday see the masterpiece that he probably had in mind all along. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tammy. Hey, thanks so much for listening to today's show. I know that there are many of you out there that are going through a hard time and I hope you found things that have been useful today as you listen to the podcast. If you would like to access the show notes from today's podcast, 
visit my website. It is storiesofhopepodcast.com. That is where you'll find favorite quotes from today's episode and shareable memes. And those are fun because you can share them with your friends on social media. You will also find the links mentioned throughout today's episode so you don't have to remember what those were. And also all the tips that were shared. Sometimes tips are shared so much throughout an episode you forget. What were those great things? So go to the show notes, storiesofhopepodcast.com to look up these fantastic resources. You know, if someone kept coming to mind during today's episode, perhaps that means that you should share this with them. Maybe there was a story shared or a tip that they really, really need to hear. So go ahead and share this episode with them. May God bless you, especially if you are struggling with hope to carry on and with the strength to keep going when things get tough. Remember to walk with Christ and he will help bear that burden. Above all else, remember God loves you.